The sounds you just heard are gobbles of wild turkeys here in Stevens State Forest. Not very many people have seen a wild turkey, but there are literally hundreds of them in this small tract of forest land in south central Iowa. There are scattered populations of them elsewhere in the state also that have been introduced by the Iowa Conservation Commission. Tonight we're going to look at the, the wild turkey in Iowa. Benjamin Franklin thought that the wild turkey ought to be our national bird. It's always been associated with wildness and naturalness, and anyone who's ever seen one can tell you it's a very exciting experience. Benjamin Franklin called them a noble bird. Well, besides looking at that noble bird itself, we're going to look at some of the studies that wildlife biologists are doing with the population here in Stevens. The wild turkey is native to Iowa, but was extinct in the state until it was reintroduced in this century. Iowa used to have large areas covered with the kind of forest habitat that the wild turkey needs. Most of those forest areas are gone now, but the Stevens State Forest is an exception. So this is one of the areas where turkeys have thrived since they were brought back to the state. The eastern wild turkey is the subspecies which was native in Iowa. This is only one of six subspecies that at one time covered a large portion of what is now the United States. Our domestic birds are descendants of the Mexican wild turkey native to this area. Turkeys were first domesticated by the Indians of Central America who raised them primarily on corn. Terry Little of the Iowa Conservation Commission explains the restocking program of eastern wild turkeys in Iowa. We have been involved in uh, a fairly large turkey restoration program for about the past five years, uh, transplanting wild birds to various timbered areas all over the state and uh, as a result of this release program we are seeing turkey populations in uh, timbered habitats that we did really not expect them to uh, survive and do well in at all uh, where we released them on a for pretty much on an experimental basis. We've uh, released these birds at approximately 54 different sites around the state. Now some of these sites are not too far apart but we've released birds in northeast Iowa in, in the, uh, the picturesque river country up there in Al McKee, Clayton, Winnesheet counties. And we've released birds all across the southern two tiers of counties, the south, particularly the southeast corner of the state, where there's, no, again, large amounts of timber remaining. We've put birds in the Luss Hills in western Iowa. It's a string of steep, uh, sandy hills mm -hmm. that are ex extend from the Iowa-Missouri border almost to Sioux City. We put several release sites there, and we've also stocked several of the central and north central Iowa river valleys. So the Des Moines River here at Boone and uh, up by Fort Dodge both have release sites. And we put birds on the Iowa River and the Cedar River and the Wapsipinicon River in east central Iowa in areas where there are still some timber remaining. And we think that based on what we're seeing at these, uh, these other areas, that maybe birds could survive there. So we really have stocked probably 75 to 80 percent of the remaining timber in the state uh, with turkeys. Yeah. Stevens State Forest is in south central Iowa. There are several tracts of land in this forest, although the turkey study is confined mainly to this tract in Lucas County. Stevens Forest is part of the Sheraton River drainage system. This type of habitat, hilly, forested, upper river valley, is well suited to wild turkeys. The oak and hickory trees and brushy undergrowth in this area were common in much of Iowa. Stevens also has several stands of planted evergreens. Stevens State Forest includes several small lakes and is surrounded by cropland. That would greet a visitor to Stevens early on a spring morning. Most any sound will start a roost full of turkeys gobbling. We heard these turkeys along a major highway on the edge of the forest. In the very early spring, the gobblers, the male turkeys, travel in fairly large groups of 25 to 50. These groups generally roost together in treetops. They gobble on the roost and shortly after flying off the roost about sunrise. Cars on the highway, birds, songs, and even a dog's bark can start a round of gobbles.
The male turkey uses this striking sound to attract hens during the early spring. By this time of year, the male turkey has pretty much stopped eating for the duration of the mating season. In order to be able to do that, he has stored up energy by eating heavily to build a fat reserve in the so-called breast sponge. This situation presents a paradox. At this time of the year, food supply is short for most wild animals. At this same time, the male turkey must find adequate food to build up the fat deposits that will carry him through his mating season. A large part of what the biologists at Stevens State Forest are doing is to study what the turkeys eat, where they find it, and how they, in general, survive Iowa's harsh winters. Gay Krim is in charge of these aspects of the study. Okay, the basic point of my study is to try and find out what parts of the forest the birds use in the winter. We're trying to figure out. Um, they say that besides the first two weeks of life for a turkey, the most critical time for them is in the winter when they're going to be hard pressed for food with the snow cover. So we're trying to figure out what part of this forest area they prefer, what they like the best as far as just general cover and food. And then that way we can maybe extrapolate that to other parts of the state and figure out where else we can put birds. Well, this was a particularly rough winter. What mostly did the birds eat this winter, can you tell? When the really heavy snow came, they did move down to the cornfields. But um, in between times, they did stay in the timber some days, and we weren't really sure what they were eating from the droppings that we've analyzed. They seem to have eaten, found uh, some insects, either uh, on the trees or underneath, and then corn. They've also, it was a poor mast year, but they did seem to find some acorns early in the year. So we did find that they would hit like either our bait sites or the cornfields, and then maybe for a couple days they'd stay in the timber and then they'd go back to the cornfields again. So it was almost like they'd hit the corn when they needed an energy boost, and then they'd move off and maybe for a couple days they could scratch around in the timber and find enough, and then they'd go back to the cornfields again. The turkeys there in Stevens seem to be relying rather heavily on some of the uh, outlying crop land and some of the, the farmers had contracted some of their land for supporting the turkeys, I guess. Um, will that, do you think, have a, a major effect on maintaining populations in Iowa? I think that's probably the, the one single key to the reason we have such excellent turkey populations. Probably uh, on the Crim Study area and in Shimmick State Forest in Lee County and in Yellow River State Forest, in Key County, we have enough timber remaining that we could support turkeys in the traditional manner without reliance on corn. But we have turkeys in many, many uh, areas other than those, and we're convinced at this time that it's the presence of that waste grain in the wintertime that allows those birds to survive, and that's really why they're doing that study, is to document that. But we're just, we can't believe it's anything else at this time that's allowing such excellent overwinter survival of our birds. Even though the turkeys seem to depend on the corn to a great extent, there is a wide variety of natural food available to them in Stevens Forest. Biologists call this general food supply mast. The eastern wild turkey seems to prefer acorns and hickory nuts. But particularly around the edge of cornfields, roads and other disturbed areas, the turkeys may find the seeds of black locust and when the snow is deep, the turkeys may also feed on taller plants, such as the seed heads of sumac. Winter provides an opportunity to study the wild turkey in many ways, simply because snow cover makes it relatively easy to see the birds. And the scarcity of food makes it relatively easy to lure them to bait sites where they can be captured, tagged, and studied. Gay and Lloyd Krim, Iowa State University graduate students, and Marlene and Bruce Ayersman, who work for the Conservation Commission, do the field work involved in the study. This is a pouch of marker we put on there. So we're using pink for adult birds and yellow for the juvenile birds. See, this will be bird number 12, whereas the master bird number, she'll be known as bird number 91 all the time. The pouch of the markers make them easier for us to identify individuals in the field, which is the basic point of putting them on, so that we can be out on the road and see the bird in the field, uh, like out in the cornfield, and know which bird that is. Because we've never seen these. Is there much trouble with them losing the 
ponchos? Well, that's, they, they could. That's why we put that potato band in. That bird should be permanently marked from now on. 13.7 leg. And 8.1 on the toe. The ninth primary is 28.5. In fact, she's light might just be because she's having a hard winter. Hard winter. I believe that's probably it. Uh, uh -huh. So she's a beach. Yeah. And we've got 24. Yeah, one wing indicates she's an adult. The legs, I'd go with the belt. I think she is. Uh, we're cooperating with uh, Dr. John Barnes at the VMRI up at Ames. He's doing a lot of work on the turkeys, and we're sending him the blood or blood smears, and he's looking for parasites or various uh, aspects of the blood. This is a solar powered radio that is being attached by lightweight cords around the front of the body of a gobbler. We'll talk more about these radios later. The turkeys are also carefully weighed. Hens average about eight to 11 pounds. That's three and a half to five kilograms on the metric scale that the biologists use. Gobblers average about twice that weight. The juvenile males about this time of year will probably be weighing 15, 16, 17 pounds right in there. So just be a little less than the adult males. So the, the juvenile hands will probably be weighing oh, about, what, seven, eight pounds, somewhere in there. Do the, do the juvenile hands uh, nest the first year? Yeah, yeah maybe not all of them. That's well, one thing we're gonna find out, but uh, what data we do have, they will nest the first year. Mm -hmm. We've looked now at what the biologists at Stevens State Forest are doing with the wild turkeys. In a moment, we'll look at the birds in their natural habitat. The chances of seeing a wild turkey like this are slim, at least during most of the year. Generally, it's nearly impossible to get very close to them except during the mating season when they seem to be much less wary. Most people who see a wild turkey probably will see it from a distance like this. In case you're wondering, the turkeys in this picture are in the lower center of the screen. These birds were about 300 yards away from our camera. We found the birds positioned on the side of a hill in a way that allowed them to see a large portion of the countryside. For every chance to see a turkey, there are many chances to see turkey tracks like these in the snow. During our winter filming, we saw a lot of these tracks. Wildlife biologists sometimes call them turkey highways. The wild turkey's eyesight is exceptionally keen. They're able to see bright colors and movements over enormous distance. One of the ways the airsmans and the crims keep track of the birds they are studying is through radio tracking. 
By attaching a self-contained radio transmitter to the birds, they're able to find a given turkey or a group of turkeys by tracking the individual signals those radios send out. The tracking antenna are mounted on the cars and pickups, and they have handheld units that they can use in the woods. Probably the most reliable way to see wild turkeys is by blind sitting. Wild turkeys are most sensitive to movement, so even when sitting in a blind, one has to be very still. The Ayersmans and Crims set up several blinds in the Stevens Forest adjacent to bait sites where they use corn to lure turkeys into a clearing. We found it could be many cold hours before the turkeys show up, if they ever do. But the wait is made pleasant by the sights and sounds of the forest. The corn at the bait sites attracts not only the turkeys for whom it's intended, but just about any other hungry forest creature as well. Besides the chickadees and cardinals and other songbirds, we watched these quail for about 15 minutes. Birds aren't the only ones to take advantage of an easy winter meal. Squirrels nearly always hang around these bait stations. But of course it's the turkeys we came to see, and eventually they did arrive. The large neck tag you'll see identifies bird number five in the study. When turkeys come into the bait sites, biologists can trap them with what is called a cannon net. In order for the net to work, the turkeys have to be in a particular place at the bait site. In order to catch the group of gobblers we watched being tagged, Bruce Ayersman waited for hours after the turkeys arrived at the site for them to get in proper position just next to the net so that they could be trapped. The net is camouflaged and attached to heavy weights set on poles. From inside the blind, explosive charges in the back of the weights are detonated. The charges fire the weights out, pulling the net over the birds. Biologists then remove the turkeys from the net. This isn't always a simple process. They hold the birds in individual boxes until they're able to work with them. We were struck with how docile wild turkeys seemed to be. They didn't peck or they didn't struggle very much while they were being held during the complicated process of being tagged, weighed, and generally handled. The hen turkey is generally lighter in color than the gobbler. The hen's body and tail feathers have light colored tips. Hens are smaller and their heads are partially feathered. This hen has what's called a beard. This is a clump of unique feathers which grows out of the breast. The beard is typically a male characteristic, but there are a few hens that may develop a beard. The gobbler or male turkey has several distinctive physical traits. The fleshy growths that hang around the gobbler's head and neck are called wattles and caruncles. During courtship and mating, these growths swell with blood and become brightly colored in shades of blue and red. In both the hen and the gobbler, on top of the head is a fleshy pointed growth called the frontal caruncle. So a lot of drawings or pictures of turkeys and they'll have a, a big thing hanging down off their bill or the front and it's, this is what it is and on the gobbler it's a little a little bigger and a little longer, and it'll elongate and lay down over the bill, especially when they're gobbling. Right now in the winter, the gobblers will it'll just be short. Just like the hens. And just like the hens right now, but then there is a, it's a little bigger and it'll elongate and just fall down over the over the bill like that, and you'll see a lot of drawings like that, and that's just a, another characteristic of them. An older gobbler can weigh as much as 25 or 30 pounds. Gobblers are also considerably darker than hens because their feathers are tipped in black. From the time they're about a year old, gobblers will have a beard of some size or shape. Gobblers also grow spurs that they may use as weapons during the mating season. The American Indians found turkey spurs hard enough and sharp enough to use as arrowheads.
During the short days of winter, the turkeys travel in fairly large flocks with hens and gobblers together. The critical problems facing them are finding food and maintaining their body temperature. They presumably spend most of the daylight hours looking for food and the long cold nights roosting in trees. We noticed on the crim study area that a lot of the turkeys are, seem to be roosting in the conifer trees there. Is that a necessity? Do they have to have that type of tree to... Well, I, I don't think, personally think it's a necessity. Uh, there are turkeys surviving on up into southeastern Minnesota doing quite well in areas where they don't have conifers to roost. I think it's more a matter of preference. There's a lot of information that indicates that a conifer tree in canopy and a big stand of conifers has a more favorable microclimate during cold weather. Their birds are able to maintain their body heat a little bit easier in these areas than they would be out in a hardwood canopy where there's no protection from the wind and, and uh, heat loss. But, as I said, uh, the birds in southeastern Minnesota are doing quite well without this conifer cover, and I think it's simply a matter of preference. Given a choice, they'll go to the conifers, but I, at this time, would have to say I don't think it's a necessity. It's just something mm -hmm. that they're using because it, it's uh, available to them. It's during this time in the late winter that gobblers in particular must feed heavily in preparation for the mating season. As the days get longer and the weather begins to warm up, courting and the mating season begin. The gobbling we heard earlier signals the start of this. Turkeys seem to be fair weather birds. If a day isn't clear and still, they probably won't gobble. As the mating season gets underway in earnest, the large gobbler groups usually break up into smaller mating groups. Generally, the dominant males in the group will mate with several hens. In the mating groups, the gobblers display by spreading their tail feathers, puffing up their body feathers, strutting, and going through a complex series of acts which both attract hens and establishes which males are dominant. The strutting, displaying gobbler is among the most exciting sights in nature. This is what a gobbler looks like normally, a sleek bird with feathers lying close to his body. You can see the beard sticking out from below his neck. But this puffed up, strutting bird with tail feathers fanned out is a displaying gobbler. By the way, if that shape looks familiar to you, it could be because drawings of birds like this are what many of us colored in the third grade around Thanksgiving time. It may be more picturesque, but it's not what a wild turkey gobbler looks like in November. This display occurs only during the spring mating season. With the close of the mating season, the hens begin to nest. It is during this time that the hunting season on gobblers takes place. Because of the success of the Conservation Commission's efforts at reintroducing turkeys into the state, there are several areas in Iowa with a wild turkey season. Well, our hunting seasons right now are all in southern Iowa. Mm -hmm. We have six hunting zones and we think we've had very excellent hunting seasons. We uh, have restricted, of course, our hunting to the zones that have been, uh, had turkey populations in for quite a while, but w about one out of five turkey hunters in Iowa kills a turkey, and that is ex maybe uh, twice to three times higher than most states uh, are able to do. And uh, we see that most of our other release sites, particularly northeast Iowa and the Lust Hills, seem to be coming along quite well, and I would be not at all surprised if we have much larger areas open to hunting within uh, two to five years. I would say that uh, in the short run, in the next five to ten years, our turkey program is going to blossom and we're going to develop pro uh, turkey populations all over the state, and most of these are ha simply have to rely on private land. Uh, we own so little forest land that we can protect and, and maintain and manage that we must rely on the private landowner. But yeah, I would be less than honest if I said that in the long run, 20 to 25 years from now, the turkey program will probably be in, in, pro in jeopardy. Uh, we're losing forest land at alarming rates in the state, perhaps 2% or more a year. We only have about a million and a half acres of timber left out of what was at one time 7 million acres. Mm -hmm. And we're continuing to lose that as, as more forest land and very marginal crop lands should not be farmed anyway as, as cleared and planted the crops or pasture, or as people move out of our smaller towns and, and uh, or larger towns and smaller cities, rather, into these wooded areas along stream bottoms that make very nice home sites, yeah. but by doing so, they are removing a very limited, are removing some uh, substantial amounts of wildlife habitat in, in many areas 
particularly in central Iowa here, there's so little of that left that it's really having a critical effect. So if this, these two trends continue, and I see no reason why they don't, won't continue, I would have to say that in the long run, we will, our turkey program will fall back and we'll, we'll end up with turkeys probably only in um, less extensive areas than we will maybe 10 years from now, unless there's some way to raise the money to get that land, you know, land into public ownership to protect it. That seems to be the only feasible way to maintain timber in this state is to, uh, is to for the state to buy the land and put it in public ownership and, and leave it for parks or wildlife areas or whatever. Mm -hmm. And without some kind of a, of a program of this nature, I think that not just turkeys but all forest wildlife in this state are certainly going to see hard times in the future just as they have in the past 10 years. We are committed to restoring the wild turkey because it was a native bird, mm -hmm. restoring it to this state regardless of whether or not we can actually hunt them in all these areas. We are very interested in, in bringing turkeys back uh, in areas that may be too small to allow a hunting season, but yet the people that live in those areas could get some enjoyment by going out and listening to gobbling in the morning, uh, seeing birds along a field edge, and just allowing people who are really not interested in hunting these birds uh, the privilege of, of seeing a native wildlife species that I'm sure 15 years ago nobody ever thought would ever be seen again in this state.